Hey everyone, it's me, Kirk Maston here at Maston Labs. I'm coming to you live and I'm ready for your questions as I edit. Today, I'm gonna to be editing a lifestyle photo shoot that I shot down in Sayulita, Mexico uh, with my friends Edgar and Madison. And it's gonna be really fun to show you all the things that I do uh, for an entire set of images and how I tackle different lighting situations and how I decide which presets to use. Um, I'll be using the Mass and Labs three-step workflow for the entire video. Uh, it's in almost in every video that we shoot, but a real quick rundown is the way Mass and Labs works is you apply the preset, then you adjust the exposure, and then you adjust the white balance and tint. And that's all you got to do to get a really nice edit. So let's jump in. And as I said before, if you have any questions as I'm going, don't hesitate to ask them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer every single question. So let's get started. Um, I've got 39 images, as you can see, from a uh, one of the test shoots that we did down in Mexico last winter. So for new um, films, new packs that we're developing and we did this fun little side side shoot here and I thought it would be really nice to edit this today and show you how I would approach kind of a mini lifestyle session. One of the main things that I think about when I'm about to edit a session is I think of what kind of vibe am I going for? Uh, what is the, the, the kind of the subject matter of what I'm shooting and how does that relate to what preset pack I use? Our, our uh, Adventure Everyday and Fuji Color Everyday packs, they are like designed for lifestyle shoots. So uh, they, they've got a little bit of everything. They've got each pack has got a very vibrant and colorful preset in it. Each pack has got more of a uh, more subdued, um, moodier uh, kind of lifestyle look in it. So for Fuji Color Everyday, that would be uh, Superior 400 is the very colorful one. Fuji Color C200 is the uh, kind of more mellow, moodier one. And then both packs also have a black and white preset in them. I'll, I'll expand these real quick so you can see. But Ektar, Gold 200, and Triax, they live in adventure every day. Ektar is a colorful one. Uh, let me get the exposure here right. Get it close. Ektar is a very colorful one. Gold 200 is the slightly uh, more subdued one. And then, you know, Triax is black and white. And then in the... It, Fuji Color Everyday Pack, we've got Fuji Color uh, or Superior 400, which is the very vibrant one, C200, which is the more uh, mellow one, and then Acros 100, which is just a fantastic black and white look. So for this shoot, I'm going to choose Fuji Color Everyday, and I'm going to go through it, go through the entire session. It's 39 photos. I'm going to show you how I approach every photo and how I approach every section. We go from uh, mid-afternoon to late at night, in and out of the light, into shade, different skin types, and hopefully you will learn a lot from this video. So again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Now is your time. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be seeing this as a rerun on uh, YouTube or on Facebook, and you won't be able to answer, I won't be able to ask, answer your questions as easily. So do it now. Don't wait. Okay, let's dive in. And here we go. Um, so here they are walking towards this cool like gate in a hotel. Um, I'm going to decide kind of right from the get go, how do I want to treat my open shade images for the rest of the set? So open shade is when they're not in direct sunlight, they're in kind of op open shade. I don't know how else to put it, but you can see like this is open shade here at the bottom of, of these, uh, gates here is like full sun. So right behind Madison, you can see it's full sun, but they're walking into open shade. Open shade is really nice light because it's very flat, very even, super easy to work with, and you can pull the exposure way up to get kind of a light and airy image. So I have to decide right now, do I want a kind of more mellow open shade look or a slightly more punchy open shade look with Superior 400? I'm not even gonna consider black and white right now because I'm gonna save that for later in the day when it becomes nighttime uh, when I have trickier lighting situations, or I come across an image that's got some really graphic elements that would look really good in black and white. So my first consideration is how colorful do I want my open shade images to be? 
Um, I'm going to actually pick C200, which is a little bit less colorful on these because we've got some reflection from the green around them and you can see that on their skin tone. But regardless, I can correct this pretty easily. So I, I applied C200. I'm going to do my three-step workflow and I'm going to adjust exposure first and then temperature and tint. So exposure, I'm going to bring up just a little bit to unblock the midtones. You notice before I did that, uh, they're very super saturated, their skin tones, and there's no detail in Edgar's shirt. I always recommend, you know, if you want to kind of unlock the full tonal range in an image, play with the exposure slider and bring it up a little bit. You're not going to ruin it um, at all because the way that our, our presets are built, they model film, they're going to protect the highlights. If I hit the J key, you can see only a little tiny sliver is pure white. And already this bright white down here by her, by her feet is protected by the preset itself. So bring up the exposure, unblock the really dark tones like his black t-shirt, and this will also clear up the skin, make it look a little bit nicer. And this image isn't meant to be dark and moody either. I mean, if I wanted this to be dark and moody, I would dig into the Portrait Push Pack, which is a different pack, which I'm not gonna be editing with today. But there you go. So apply the preset, Increase the exposure, and now I'm going to tackle temperature and tint. As far as temperature goes, um, I'm going to leave it a little bit warm, so I might drop it just a tiniest bit towards a, a you know blue, like cooler. And now the real main issue is this green cast, this green reflection on their skin. So I'm going to use the tint slider and go up a little bit in magenta. So just a tiny bit. That's it. So here is before and after. Um, actually, on second thought, I'm going to actually drop the temperature again just a little bit. There we go. So there's before and after. Really simple. Preset, exposure, white balance and tint. Now that I've got that, I'm going to, and this is, this is when I do a speed edit, this is the big takeaway here, is once you've got one image right, and I've got all these other images that were shot in roughly the same light. Okay, so I'm, I'm not, I'm shooting completely in manual here. And these images are in the same light. I'm going to hover over my first image that I edited. I'm going to hold down the shift key. And select the next like bunch of images. Then I'm going to hit sync. Check all. And then synchronize. You can do this many different ways. If you were in the grid uh, or if you're in the library module, you don't even have to hit, uh, you don't even have to select all of these things here. I think it just lets you do, uh, just syncs the photo to the next photo, like everything. But if you're doing it in the develop module, you know, I select everything here to make sure it's all being carried over. And that, just doing that, that's basically finished the shoot, or at least this part of it. Um, some of these images, maybe they need a slight exposure bump, but that's super easy. I've already taken care of temperature and tint. So, you know, that's a real time saver. I've been editing photos, oh gosh, for like 20 years. So if, if I go too fast on anything, just let me know. Because I, I assume that a lot of people know the same things that I do. Um, but if, if something is too quick or too fast, just let me know and I'll slow down. But that is how I edit. I'll get one image right, apply it to the next, you know, in the series. And I've already got my temperature and tint dialed in. And now all I have to do is maybe adjust exposure because maybe they walked into a little deeper shade. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to, and this is a, this is a Kirk thing. I'm going to go down to the transform panel and I'm going to play with upright because I just can't abide and that is the word. I cannot abide by things not being the right perspective. It just drives me up the wall. Maybe it doesn't matter to you. That's totally cool. Uh, but upright is a tool that lets you either draw on angles that should be, you know, straight to each other like that. You see how the image is starting to become, you know, corrected. Let me just do one more here. Oh, that, that looks insane. Okay, maybe not that far, uh, but but up until the insanity point, it looked it started to correct the image, correcting this gate. Um, that stuff is really important to me. 
I'm going to actually instead just use one of the auto ones here. So here's with nothing. Here's with auto. We tried the guided one. That was a hot mess. Um, here's level. Here's vertical and full. Full is usually really good. Yeah, I usually use either full or auto. Full can go kind of cuckoo. Um, if there's too many angles, it'll try to correct everything and it goes and it breaks itself. Auto is usually a really safe bet. Auto is my favorite out of them. But see, here's the original no upright correction and here's auto. And it's that last little bit that's really important to me. Like I wouldn't deliver a photo to a client without correcting the perspective. That's just me. You do whatever you want. Some people don't care. So the next thing I'm going to do is do the same thing here. I'm going to hit auto. You can see the little tiny perspective correction. Um, you know, auto again. You know, isn't that nice? I mean, look at this. Before, looks like the archway is kind of falling backwards and it's a little bit crooked, whatever. And that kind of fixes everything. I could do an additional, you know, small rotation and crop if I wanted to get just real fiddle farty about it. So like that, you know, I got rid of that little tiny black thing on the side that I don't care for. That's just a cleaner, more editorial looking photo. And that's just by using um, the upright panel. One of my favorite tools in all of Lightroom. And, and so on and so forth. Okay, here's auto again. Cool. And here's auto again. We auto didn't really quite understand these, these uh, gate gates behind them. You see, they're still not correct. So maybe try full now nah, still doesn't get it. So, you know, if I really wanted it again to get really like fiddly about it, I would just draw my own lines and correct. There we go. And let's see, I don't want to break the internet. Let's see if this one will go to like warp speed. No, it looks pretty good. Do one more. All right, this is a tricky one. Yeah, this is, that's, that's fine, that's fine. If I turned it off, it's like that. And if it was guided, it's like that. So I think that plus a small rotation, or we could even get more fiddle farty here and just go into the transform panel itself. And I'd do a small uh, vertical adjustment to try to get these gate, gate outlines straight. Hit constrain crop so you don't have these little. So if you didn't do that, you start to have little white spots where it's uh, transformed beyond the image. But anyway, anyway, here's before and here's after. And it's just more pleasing to me to correct all that stuff. So there's the first five photos. Done. Super easy. All right, now if you are having any, uh, you know, if you have any questions, again, please ask me as I go. Okay, totally new lighting situation. They are they are now shopping for these little uh, poof ball things that you can get in Cellulita that are really cool. I can't for the life of me remember what they're called. Are they pom poms? Pom poms. They're called pom poms. They're really cool. I got some for my kids, um, but they're really pretty. They're very Instagram worthy. So if you ever go down to Cellulita, get some pom poms. Uh, but now we're in this market, totally different situation. They're in kind of deep overhead shade, you know, underneath like an umbrella. Fortunately, there's no color cast. There's no color cast from the ground. The ground is like gravel. So there's no weird colors coming from underneath and shooting up into them. Awesome. That's really good. And for this, I'm going to use, well, I'm not sure yet. I think I'm going to use Superior 400 this time. Um, and then just raise exposure up. I'm using Superior 400 because I want to really play with the color and the vibrancy of the pom poms themselves. And Superior 400's got more color in it or more vibrant color than C200. So I applied Superior 400, increased the exposure, and now I'm going to drop the white balance just a little bit to kind of tone down their skin. And often, Often people ask me like, how do you do white balance? It's really hard. How do I get good skin tones? My recommendation is to always start with temperature, get that dialed in and then do tint last. And a really good kind of pro tip for doing white balance for any photo is don't focus just on skin tones. 
try to find other elements in the photo that you intuitively know what they should look like. And that's where you can get rid of color casts. So like I'm looking at her, um, her dress. I'm actually looking at his hat a lot, looking at the t-shirt here. I'm also looking behind them, like underneath this table. Um, I'm looking at other elements besides their skin to determine where I should set white balance and tint. So in this case, if I go back to how it was shot, it's just a little bit too warm for me, for me. Some people like warm photos, but for me, it's too warm. How do I know that? For some reason, his hat is too warm to me. And also underneath the table here, this like gray floor that I can see a little peak of is too warm. So I'm going to decrease the temperature and you can see the, that warmth getting sucked out of his hat, especially. And now their skin tone is so much better. Um, so that's what I would do for temperature. And then when it comes to tint, now I'm looking for uh, any kind of hint of green or magenta in a neutral. So again, I'm looking at his hat. His hat's not really neutral, but for some reason I keep going to it. His hat, the ground underneath, his pants, the shirt, her dress. And I'm looking for any kind of, um, you know, too much green or magenta. I don't see, I, it looks fine to me. I actually wouldn't change it, but I, I can sweep this back and forth just to see if it could be a little better. And yeah, and if I go too far either way, it just starts to look gross. So I'm just gonna leave it alone. Looks perfect. Okay, we have a question. Yeah, uh, Troy Davidson uh, was asking, he said, you mentioned that exposure, well, bringing up exposure while blocks and shadows, um, but it's like it also had some highlights effect with the white. Um, so why would you not use the shadow slider versus the exposure slider? Okay, so Troy, who I know in the group, awesome. Glad you're with us, Troy. Um, why would I increase exposure rather than using uh, like one of the tone profiles to unblock the shadows? Uh, great question. So let me go back to a photo, the photo where I kind of mentioned this, and it was maybe originally this one, but I could do it. I could do it on. I could do it on this one. Okay. Because I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to leave this edit because I'm going to sync it to everything else, but I'll just start over on this one. So I used Superior 400 and I could apply it. And his question was, instead of like raising the exposure to unblock the shadows, why not um, just use a tone profile? So a tone profile are, is a section in our... I think he's asking versus why, you, why not just raise the shadows versus the exposure slider. Oh, why not just raise the shadow slider? Um, I wouldn't raise the shadow slider because that would break the formula for the, for the preset. And every preset is based on a film model that we've developed internally for every film. So the, so the way the film would, would actually respond. So yes, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, go crazy, do what you want. If you want to, if you want to go outside of how the film should look, I mean, and should is only like rough, roughly like how it actually would look. To what you want it to look like yes go ahead you can you can take the uh shadow slider up my only uh only caution there is that if you notice as i take this shadow slider up to unblock the shadows it starts to look like hdr like especially like around her head and and that that veers away from film and i don't i don't care for it as much because film is kind of my my guiding light great question though um, so if I were to, you know, do that to this instead, oh, whoops, not contrast, sorry. If I was to take the shadow slider up, it just starts to lose a, a film look, which is so delicate. Film, a film look, a true film look is incredibly delicate. It's like ice cream. And the more you futz with an image, the more you kind of pull it and, and, and tweak it, the quicker it looks digital, like becomes distinctly digital. It's like ice cream you have to be very careful with it because once it melts it's it's very hard if not impossible to make it ice cream again um and that's how i feel about a true film look is that it's a very delicate touch so great question troy great question that it really comes down to like there's about 50 ways to do anything in lightroom um and one way may suit you better than another but to follow our formula, our three-step workflow is important because it cuts down on work and it preserves that delicate film look throughout the whole process. That's my answer. 
Okay, so here is the before and after of this image. Um, I like to look at before and after sometimes when I do one edit before, you know, before applying it to a bunch because it really helps me decide like, you know, did I stay true to the white balance? Like, does that look right? You know, remembering back to the shoot itself, is that how I wanted it? And I think it's perfect because I picked a, I picked the most colorful preset in that pack. I picked Superior 400. I think it goes really well with the colorful environment that they're in. And I'm keeping it kind of warm, the, the overall edit warm, because they're in Sayulita, Mexico, and it's a tropical place, and that fits the vibe. If this was like in a chalet in Switzerland or something, right? Which would be great to go to someday. Um, I would probably not edit this warm because it doesn't fit that environment. I would edit very neutral or, <clears throat> or possibly cool because no one wants to see yellow snow. Let's face it. <clears throat> okay, so this image is edited. I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Let's just pretend I never edited that. I've got these next three images, and I'm just going to go back to my original edit, hold down the shift key, just click through to where, you know, I've got that whole scene done, hit sync, you know, check all if it's not already checked, and then synchronize. And now, um, now I just hit, you know, command D to deselect, or I wish there was a way to just unselect back to just the one photo. There is a way. Okay. Command shift D. Who would have thought? Okay. I'm learning. I'm learning guys. So apparently command shift D. Yes. Thank you. Casey is the macro. He's the macro king. Um, yeah. So go back to your original image and now you can kind of click through and be like, do I like how that kind of general edit played out? It looks like they're a little bit too, um, the exposure is a little bit too high on the following one. So maybe I adjusted my camera halfway through. Um, so I'm just going to drop the exposure a bit, but the white balance and everything else is ready. You know, it's pretty, pretty simple adjustment. Here's a little detail shot. You can see these really cool pom poms. Um, I love this detail actually, his cool rings, like hands. I love hands. Actually, that's really cool too. Look at that. Good stuff before and after that is the delicate look of film that is so hard to preserve so hard it's it's got a richness to it a certain level of micro contrast that stuff was really really hard to develop um and i and i love it and it's important to me it's very important to me if you've never shot film before maybe it doesn't matter so much to you or maybe you see it and you like it you don't know why because you haven't shot film but once you get into shooting film you're going to crave this level of uh, micro contrast which is kind of a that that 3d effect without it looking fake without without it looking hdr i love it okay enough blabbing next shot uh this this one is cool really nice composition um there's a whole sequence here where we you know I move them down off the stairs. Um, there's a book they've been reading. You know, I'm, I'm working on connection. See there, how they're holding hands. This, this is a whole nother, this is a whole nother series. It's just on how to work with people to get, you know, non um, stilted looking stiff imagery, which, you know, may, I'd be happy to teach if people are interested. It's actually really easy. It's so easy. People sell like huge courses on this, which is great. They probably, they probably actually, they're probably way better at it than I am. Um, but, uh, I love working with people to try to get something real out of them. And it's really just about a conversation and it's about psychology and about understanding what they're thinking. Once you do, it makes it way easier. So if people are interested in that, I could do that someday in the future. But anyway, all right, back to this image. So this whole sequence here is shot in the same light everything with the blue wall. I don't think I changed much. Maybe this one has a slightly darker exposure. So what? Big whoop. So what? Um, we'll fix that later. This image in particular, I wanted to do two different ways. So we could do, eh, I think we're going to do superior 400. We're going to stick with that for now because it has that nice colorful wall. So here's a quick superior edit. So I applied superior, drop the exposure just a little bit. Um, temperature and tint, 
looks right. It's a little bit green. Her skin tone is a little bit green. So I'm going to go up a couple points. There's a quick before and after edit. Um, I'm also going to do lens correction on. This is a tool I haven't talked about yet, but this gets rid of vignetting and distortion. And I might do a slight image rotation. Eh. There we go. Yeah. I want you to notice how casual I am about this. This is really important, like in a long-term career kind of sense that you don't burn out. Don't get totally caught up in making every single little detail of every photo perfect because A, you're going to make it look artificial. I mean, unless that's your thing, you're like shooting like for a product catalog or like, I don't know, like some things have to look artificial, like some model shoots. Yes. You're like doing massive retouching, but A, it starts to look artificial and B, it takes all of your time and no one cares. They're not looking at the little tiny details. They're looking at the authentic, you know, lifestyle bits. And that's going to save you a lot of time. Um, I pity people who get so caught up and they get stressed out and they're like, I've been tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking this photo and it's stressing me out and do the skin tones look right, etc." cetera. Um, if you just edit a bunch of images, step back, or maybe like take a day off and look at them again, you'll see that, that you did an amazing job and that stress is not worth it. Just move on. It's a, I just watched the Lion King. It's like Hakuna Matata, like, what happens in the past, just leave it in the past and look forward to the future. And I, and I take that approach with editing. Um, if you overthink and edit, you will ruin it. If you stress out about it, you will ruin it. I, you'll, you can see that I'm just going pretty quick through all these and my white balances are just like to my eye. I'm not looking at numbers or anything else. I'm just kind of going with my gut. And if you overthink something, it will start to fall apart. So I just was like superior 400, it's a colorful preset, colorful environment, it's tropical, perfect. Um, I did lens correction on just cause I could see a little bit of vignetting in the corners. So if you see that, and I just am really a stickler with making things straight. So maybe I'll go over to upright. Oh, that, oh, there we go. Sometimes it gets it wrong. Sometimes it gets it really wrong. Um, I'll just do a manual rotation. But at no point am I like freaking out or stressing out about it. It should be fun. It should be a fun experience. Okay. Let's make another copy of this. And I wanted to just pull this one aside because I felt that the graphic elements in this photo would lend itself really well to black and white. So this is one of the few I'm going to pull, pull out of the mix and do black and white. Why? Because I think the reason the black and white is so cool and a lot of people don't ever shoot in black and white or know why, why would something be in black and white? Why would something be in color? It's because some images actually perform better or they're, they're cooler without color because color can be a distraction. If in black and white, I'm looking for shapes and geometry, uh, composition, light and dark. And in fact, I'm looking for sometimes very high contrast situations because when you subtract the color, you can focus on the composition. So I just thought this was cool. He's going up the stairs, there's this line. She's resting against this circle. She's doing a cool thing with her hair. And if we just turn it to black and white, um, and then increase the exposure just a little bit. There's a lot of cool stuff happening in this photo. Like you can really, you know, taking away that color, you can really focus now. Like here, this looks really good. It's great but my mind is buzzing from the color here. I can actually, it, it's like calming. And now I can look at these elements in, in a lot more detail since she is color blocked in white, um, not color blocked, but just blocked out in white. She is going to be the thing that stands out in the photo. So whatever the brightest thing is in a black and white photo, that's where your eye is always going to go to. And it's funny with color, your eye is always going to go to whatever is warmest, you know? So when I look at this with color, I'm looking at Edgar, I'm looking at Edgar. And then I look at this little flag. This is the way my eye travels. Edgar flag Madison's arm, Edgar flag Madison's arm in black and white. I'm looking at Madison and actually my, my gaze is going from Madison to this cool sculpture thing with all this depth to this flower pot and the backup to Edgar. It's like going in the opposite direction. 
because I've taken away color. It's just a cool little thing. <laughs> Another video we could do is just about um, what happens when you take away the distraction of color and, and how your eye will travel along the photo. All right, so back to this. Here's my nice edit. I'm just going to select all the other similar images. Boom, 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 and boom. Sync them. Apply the edit. Apply the same corrections. Um, and now I'm going to go down the line and go, you know, do my little exposure adjustments. So up. This one might need one up a little bit too. If I see that I, I now change my exposure for all of them, I might just do another select all and sync. You know, if I was doing a true speed edit, I wouldn't even be talking. I'd just be, you know, whipping through these. That's a nice photo. That's super nice. Look at her expression. Look at this expression, connection, everything. In fact, the only thing that kind of sucks is this little bit of yellow. So I'm just going to go in and crop that out with my favorite uh, 645 crop. This is like a medium format, like magazine cover crop. I talk about it all the time. Look at that. That's super nice. That's a that's that's the kind of lifestyle or engagement photo I like. Um, done. That looks really good, too. Maybe a slightly increased exposure. All of the uh, skin tones look great. You know, he's got darker skin, she's got lighter skin. Sometimes people ask, how do I edit a photo when I've got different skin types in the photo? Every preset or every film is just gonna be kind of calibrated to a, a certain skin type. We go over that. Uh, but what's nice about almost every film that Fujifilm makes is that they work across all skin types. So once I got Edgar dialed in or Madison dialed in, they're both dialed in. Kind of a pro tip there too. Um, do I have a question? Yes. Um, the, um, from Jerome, uh, he says, in what kind of shoots would you choose the push pad instead of Fuji every day for your double day? So Jerome asks, and hey, Jerome, what's up? We went surfing in Costa Rica <laughs> before, yeah, a long time ago. Um, so Jerome asks, when would you use, uh, which one? Uh, he says, what Fuji kind of push? shoots would Okay, so what kind of shoots would you choose one of the push packs we make over, say, Fuji Every Day? So this is Fuji Every Day. Um, I would say you would use a push pack if you wanted to go for a very moody look, um, dark and moody. So, you know, we, we might be able to get there with, I don't know, it doesn't really fit the vibe of this photo, but maybe, well, I'll show you an example. Maybe this photo. Okay, Edgar's looking a little bit moody here. You would use it in a shoot where you're trying to go for that that moody look. And I don't know any better way to describe it. It's kind of a trend you see everywhere right now. Um, but a pushed look is just a little bit darker. The colors are a little bit shifted. Um, you know, I mean, look, I'm just, I'm hovering over it and you can see that that is just a darker look. I mean, look, look at this, Portrait 800 push two stops. He looks badass in this, it looks great. But it is not, this look is not going to, in my opinion, is not appropriate one size fits all for maybe a situation like this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, people like all kinds of stuff. Who am I to say? But I, I just feel like you're a vibe sommelier with, uh, or, you know, preset sommelier. You're, you're, you're trying to match the vibe of the shoot. And vibe is a very nebulous word. Um, you're trying to match that vibe with a pack that suits it. So I think Fuji every day, the colorful, um, kind of tropical feel of that pack along with adventure every day fits this type of shoot better because it's in Mexico. If I was shooting, you know, I don't know, like a fall shoot in Chicago, um, with some really edgy individuals or like a couple shoot or something then I would certainly do like portrait push pack because I'm going to find something in there that's dark and moody that fits the vibe of what I'm doing. I hope that helps. Maybe. Yes, it does. Uh, looking at this makes me go, man, he'd look cool in black and white. That looks pretty good too. Um, so, but I'm going to go back to superior 400 because I had another one in black and white that I really wanted to do with him. There we go. This is just a cool photo. 
I had Edgar do this. Like he he was okay. Here I'll I will share opposing tip. Okay, so um, I often look for what my my subjects are doing while I'm doing something else. So people will obviously move naturally when they're not being told to do something, uh, especially if you're very comfortable with each other. And I just like looked over and I saw Edgar, he was doing that with his, he has kind of longish hair. He was just like pushing it back because it was hot and putting his hat on. And he did that once and I caught it out of my corner of my eye and I just stopped everything and said, hey, Edgar, can you do that again? So he's like, sure, sure. Okay. I was like, okay, do it again. And then I was like, oh, it's not quite right. Tilt your head down a little bit. Can, can you do that again? And then he did it again. And then he was getting a little nervous. And then I made a joke and I said, can you do it again? And then finally I got it. You know, I, I knew that I got it. I got the right expression. You can see a little bit of mirth, you like kind of happiness in his eyes, but it's also, he's got that, that great kind of like half squint uh, model expression. And there's a lot of interest in the photo because he's in the middle of doing something. I love photos like this. So that is what I did to get this photo and I love it. And as soon as I took it, I was like, you know what? This is gonna look cool in, in color and in black and white. Why? Because we've got a great kind of triangle composition here where the brightest part, and remember what I said about the brightest thing in a black and white photo, the brightest part is his face. And that's gonna draw all of your attention. So let's go to black and white. Um, should I go up or down in exposure? No, oh, I think it was about right. And I'm drawn right into his face. In fact, I can make it even a little bit better by taking either a brush or a graduated neutral density filter, super long name. Um, and then uh, trying to knock down anything else that's super bright. That's, I mean, gosh, you go to photography school or you could just l remember this one rule that uh, <laughs> there's probably lots in photography school too. I, I dropped out. Um, I'm gonna just keep doing that over and over again. The lightest thing in a black and white photo is what you're gonna focus on. So I'm gonna knock down things that are not his face. A neutral, a neutral density graduated filter is nice because unlike a brush, it's gonna be completely even all the way through. And I don't have to think too hard. I'm not in here brushing, brushing, brushing. That can look really nice too, but just by adding that, that looks cool. And he looks super good in either one, I don't know. Which one do you like better? Do you like the black one? Here, let's look. Do you like the black and white one or do you like the color one better? Vote. And in fact, I'm gonna make it even nicer. I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna crop it uh, four three because that's that's the crop of magazines. Crop this one four three. All right, folks, which one do you like better? Black and white or color? Yeah, one vote for black and white. One vote for black and white, one vote for color. I don't know, they're both, they're both good. Um, you know what would look really cool is if you did a whole series of black and white. So if you took like four or five images from the set and you did all, in, and you just presented them as a black and white series, that would look really badass. So like if you took that and that and you did um, survey. So, you know, if you started building like a small gallery of just black and white, that becomes pretty strong. Looks really cool. Yeah. Two votes for color, two votes for black and white. Or not three votes for black and white. And one vote for both. <laughs> one vote for both. Okay, I'll move on. I'll move on. Okay. All right, Edgar. Uh, another cool portrait. Man, it's all in the eyes. I swear to God, it's all in the eyes. Um, did some portraits of Madison. That looks good. I actually might warm her up just a tiny bit and increase the exposure just a tiny bit. And you can see, again, I can't stress this enough. Um, don't get too hung up on your editing to where you're not enjoying it anymore and worrying that you're not doing everything perfectly. 
sometimes just by going with your gut, you're going to get through it faster and do a more natural job. And I know that's not such great advice because it's very woo woo. And I, I really hate woo woo stuff. I hate that stuff. I like practical stuff. But I've always found with editing that if you have to make a decision that takes longer than a few seconds, it's probably going to be wrong in the in the long term. You already know, like your body, your brain, your gut brain connection, you already know what it should look like. You, you just have this uncertainty and you can get kind of hung up on it. And I, I like to just go fast. Um, that's just me. That is just me. And actually what I really like is just to shoot real film because you know, you have to even do less work, but okay. Now we are to the last part. We are at the nighttime part. Oh, and we got some real like low light, super duper stuff here for you and mixed light, which is something people always request. Um, I could take the easy way out and just make it all black and white, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just going to see kind of where we're starting at here. I'm going to do C200. It doesn't have as much red in it, so you can see they're turning kind of this weird green. Um, but you have to remember that they're in this really kind of odd mixed light with these paper like flag things above them and then light coming in off the street. A lot of light uh, in Mexico on the street is coming from like a mix, a mixture of like halogen and um, tungsten. So you have a lot, you have some pretty crazy mixed light, but we'll fix it, I promise. So C200, increase the exposure just, well, no, actually I'm gonna keep it how it was. And now this is the trickier white balance correction, but not impossible. I, I can tell you right now, it's all too green. I'm seeing green. A lot of people are probably saying it looks very yellow. Yes, it is yellow, but it's yellow and green. Uh, look at his hat. Look at her shoulder. We've got that kind of weird um, tungsten light that I don't like coming off from here. We can fix all that. So I drop the temperature and I'm going to push tint towards magenta just a little bit. And now they look pretty good. Look really good. And yeah, I shot this at F2 at a 30th of a second handheld. That was kind of a max. Uh, was this on the 6D? Canon 6D? So kind of an older camera. Um, it looks great. That is your basic nighttime outdoor edit. If you want just like accurate or accurate-ish skin tones. I'm going to check it for noise. There's almost no noise. Not bad. And now if I wanted to, I could go into the tone profile section and see if I can, you know, kind of play with this contrast that we have in the photo. It's very hard to do something about a lighting pattern after you've shot it. This kind of comes up sometimes like, why doesn't my photo look like so-and-so's photo? Uh, do I need to underexpose or overexpose when I shoot to make the preset work? Those are the wrong questions. Uh, the problem started in the actual light you were shooting in. Was it diffused? Was it from above? Was it from the side? Is it dappled? Those things cannot be changed very well after the fact. You can try with brushes and all this stuff, but it's a pain in the ass. It's never going to look good. And that's something that needs to be solved in the planning of the shoot or on the set, like dealing with the light. So I could have gotten better light here had I brought in a giant like soft box, right? I could then control the light. I could have light not coming from above. See like Edgar's face here where it's dark here and is, there's light kind of shooting down, you know, from above. I could instead bring in this beautiful, huge light source from the side and balance it with the ambient light in the photo and then really controlled it and made it look really commercial um, if I wanted to go that way. But I can't do that now because this already happened in the past and it doesn't matter how fancy you are with brushes, you can't make it look that way. And there's no preset that's going to make it look that way. And if I had overexposed this photo a ton or underexposed it, that would also not solve that problem. I hope that makes sense to people watching. A lot of things happen in camera that cannot be fixed later. And that is where you as a professional become more professional. So I appreciate the, the questions on how to make your photo look like so-and-so, but often it really comes down to the planning, the wardrobe, the lighting that you used on set or in the location. That's going to determine what you can do with the photo later. 
And I'm happy to help you make it as good as possible after you've shot it, no matter what's happened. But just, it's important to know the limitations of what's possible. So anyway, I think it still looks fine for like a, you know, a lifestyle shoot in Mexico using natural light. This looks pretty good. Looks really good. There's no noise. Skin tones look pretty good. Um, you know, as good as they can in this mixed light. And the rich color of Superior 400 also looks good in this light. Okay, so I'm going to apply that to the next, uh, you know, nine or 10 photos, see what happens. I messed with my exposure a lot during this part because it was very tricky. So it's probably not going to look very uniform throughout. So we'll just adjust as we go. Um, there's a lot more light in this photo. I dropped it down to a 13th of a second. I'm going to drop the exposure down just a little bit. She's a little bit green here. She's moved back into a little bit different light but I can fix that with tint. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm just going to apply that to the next photo. That's ah, okay. That's a little bit too dark. Big whoop. So what? Um, I'm going to crop this down because it's just too much. It's just too much above them. And I'm going to drop the exposure because it's, it looks like it's like midday. All right, there we go. It's looking better. Uh, okay, uh, now I'm at a, I'm, I'm at two eight uh, f two point eight at one fiftieth of a second. So I've gone down in exposure quite a bit. You know why? Because they're walking. So here I was felt pretty safe at doing a super slow exposure, super wide open. See this like depth of field, but here. Now that they're walking, I can't take those chances. It's very hard to focus in the middle of the night. Um, I want to make sure that they're somewhat in focus. So I increase my depth of field, sped up the shutter just a little bit and kind of cross my fingers. Um, but I can, you know, work on that with exposure. I'm not going to have as clean of an image though, because it is underexposed compared to the other two. Um, okay. Now we're getting some noise that comes from underexposure. Again, a lot of this stuff happens in camera. If you're frustrated with how something looks once you're editing it or you're using our presets or someone else's and you're still frustrated, I'll tell you that many times the problem occurred when you were taking the photo and has nothing to do with the editing. This image just doesn't have as much to work with in terms of um, tone, color, like color quality, uh, tone, everything else as this image because this image was shot quite a bit more underexposed. There's nothing you can do about it. Or you just do your best. You just do your best. Do your best. So I'm going to crop this to 645. And there we go. Let's just do the same to the next. Um, I don't want that crop. Okay, crop is gone. It still looks okay. I'm not a huge fan of this, uh, this kind of lighting. It would look so much better if I had brought my own lights, but I, I didn't. I mean, this is just a fun thing that we did in the middle of another reason we were down there. Um, one thing that I love about these images though, is I, I can ignore uh, you know, noise and I can ignore, you know, lots of things if the interaction is really cool, you know, like you could have a technically perfect photo. You brought like eight lights and you've like lit it perfectly and you have like a tech crew there and whatever, but if there's no connection between the people, it's just kind of garbage. I mean, it's just, it's like a photography school exercise. Um, not garbage. I don't want to call anyone's stuff garbage, but it just doesn't have what I think good photography should have, which is some element of connection. That, that's a very biased thing. I mean, that's, that's, I guess that's just me, but I love their expression. I love their body language. I love the way that he's holding like her finger. Um, I even love this little finger here. He's like holding the rose, but kind of carefully. All those things are really cool to me and they make me not care or get hung up on the high ISO noise from an older camera. 
All right, I'm gonna move down the line. Okay, now we're in like real bad light. I mean, like they've like moved out of like those paper lantern areas. Um, see what we can do. It looks okay. Now I might now I might kind of pull out my uh, my cheat card here, which is just use uh, black and white and play with that. I used to have a little saying to myself when I was in the middle of my photography career and I was shooting um, on very bad digital sensors. Um, I used to say, if it doesn't look right, make it black and white. <laughs> and it was the easiest way to save an image, especially when there was no digital. When I was starting out, it was all film. Black and white is what you pulled out at the reception. That's what everyone did. Not because it's like photojournalistic, which it is, I guess, but it was because it was practical. The lighting was so terrible and we didn't have digital sensors. And we couldn't, there was no such thing as a raw file. Um, black and white is what allowed you to, to shoot in those conditions. So we can just finish it out. Now that we're kind of at the limit of what this camera can do, just enjoy some black and white. Why not? I mean, otherwise those images would be kind of unsalvageable. So that's cool. We got three kind of close up, you know, cool moments between them in black and white. All right, now we're to the last part of the night where Edgar is making these amazing, like smoky uh, tequila cocktails. He's a fantastic bartender, famous and all around awesome guy. I miss him. Um, and we had these drinks up on top of the roof of the place that we had, we had rented. These are the pom-poms. These are the pom-poms that we bought. Aren't they cool? Look at that. Look how cool these pom-poms are. Okay. So now we're at the last step here. Uh, this is particularly bad lighting, which is why we shot up here, but it also has a really cool mood. So let's see what works here. There's C200. Superior 400 is too colorful. I can tell you right off the bat. Look at under his hat. It's just too saturated. Um, and black and white kind of loses. Oh, that looks cool too. Never mind. Okay, black and white looks cool too. But I'm going to do C200 and probably edit this whole series with it. Again, real quick gut check. I just went through them. What did it, what looked right? C200. I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to like edit the whole thing twice. I don't feel like I need to ask a ton of people which one I should use. I'm just going to go with it because it feels right. And I know that I've got all these other shoots in my future where I can try different things. Um, and I'm just going to enjoy the edit. So C200, increase the exposure a bit, drop the temperature. Don't freak out that the temperature slider is almost all the way to the end. That's fine. You're in very extreme light. Uh, drop the temperature slider. I'm going to sweep the uh, tint slider back and forth, see if I can find something I like better. Um, I say just maybe a tiny bit more magenta. I liked how his shirt was looking. Well, no, wait. Psych. I'm, I'm looking actually at this little strip of uh, cement right here between the tile, and I'm using that to determine where uh, the tint slider should be. So right about, yeah. Okay. And let's see if upright can help us out here. No, it, it just can't see this, this thing like I can. That's totally cool. I'm just going to do it manually. Cool. Uh, his drink like mixer thing falls right on a rule of thirds square thing, which I guess is good. I get more points. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I never felt that the rule of thirds was necessarily a hard and fast rule. I think sometimes it can make a photo really boring. Um, but however, whenever I do use a cropping tool and something lands on it, I'm always like, "Yay, I won! I must have did that on purpose." Um, so there's there's a quick edit. C two hundred, the more mellow, the more mellow brother of Superior four hundred. It keeps the vibe, the warm vibe of making cocktails on a roof in Mexico. So I go with it. Um, C200 also has really nice kind of yellowy golden highlights, which you can see on his arm, which I really like. So we're going to, we're going to roll with that. 
I'm going to apply it to the rest of the photos and see what happens. I'm going to take the uh, crop off and the transform off this syncing because I don't want those little adjustments to sync to the other photos. I want just the basic stuff to sync. So I applied it. And now I'm just going to work my way through this. Um, shooting at f4. Let's see if lens correction will do anything. Yeah, lens correction looks good. So I'm actually going to apply lens correction, go back through, sync it again. Okay, that synced the lens correction to all of them. Now let's get to work. So increase the exposure. Um, maybe drop the temperature a tiny bit more. Yeah, right about there. I'm going to do a quick uh, like rotation. Go to the next one. And increase the exposure again. Drop the white balance just a little bit. That looks good. I don't want to correct out all of the, the warmth. I mean, I could try to go for like absolutely neutral skin tones, but then you lose like the feeling of this location. So if I drop the temperature slider lower, you know, down to like here, that's, whoops, gosh, to about here, maybe a little bit higher. That's like true neutral, but it's completely lost that warmth. That sucks. I don't like that. So I don't want it to be like crazy pants like that, but I don't want it to be that either. That's pretty sterile. So I'm going to go with that, which is just like a little bit of warmth. Do you have a question? Okay, so what's her name again? Jillian? Jillian. Jillian. Okay, sorry. I can't see from here. Okay, so Jillian asks, like, as you're, as you're choosing black and white or color from shoot to shoot, and you're using different presets uh, based on the mood of that shoot, does that compromise your style? Like, are you losing your style in that? Um, I would say no, because you're finding consistency within the type of shoot. So say you always shoot boudoir using portrait pushed which is a great idea. Like but I, my, my personal recommendation, use portrait pushback, boudoir, dark and moody, right? If you live in that universe of using that, those presets, and that's what you consistently do for boudoir, and then say you also shoot weddings, and, on, and when you shoot weddings, you, you're shooting in a light and bright environment, and you're always using Fuji 400H from Fuji Original, you are staying internally, internally consistent in your style. That doesn't mean that you have to pick like one pack and use it across everything you shoot forever and ever. Um, that that doesn't quite make sense. But the fact that the fact that you're using Master Labs, period, means that you're already committing to a film realistic style. That's already a consistency there. A lot of other presets, preset companies, they they do really cool stuff, but it's not tied to anything real, and and it can tend to be super stylized. For example. Maybe you use a preset where like there is no green, like green is gone. Green has been forbidden. There's no green. Green becomes like brown or like nothing. Um, that is a big jump in style. Like if you were to use that type of preset and then use Mastin for everything else, there would be a huge clash. But because you're in the bigger circle of film, if you're using a subset inside of that, you're still saying you're still staying consistent. Uh, some people get really caught up on like, do I use like one preset out of a pack only to be really consistent? And I would say no, because you're still within film, the look of real film. Um, you will find that you will tend to gravitate to a particular film type over time and you'll know what fits you. Uh, but I believe your style is partially, well, your style is your consistency period. So that's like consistency of what lens you use, what lens length do you normally shoot very wide, very, you know, middle, very tight, um, you know, committing to like one lens length or maybe two lens lengths and that's it. 
that's a really good move. Highly recommend it. Um, I over 20 years, I only shot with a 35 and a 50. That's it. I, ex I explored everything else you know, for a few years, and then I settled on that. That was a huge, huge step in establishing a style. Uh, my next step was to determine film. I love shooting in film. I still shoot mostly in film. That was another step. Which film didn't matter so much as the fact that I was shooting film. So film in general has a look, and that's what we give you with Mass and Labs. Um, and then the other part of your style is, how do you tell a story? What are you shooting? Do you do a lot of close-ups? Do you do a lot of stuff far away? Do you use a lot of layers? Do you use a lot of depth of field? Do you find clean backgrounds? Do you focus on expression? Do you shoot people, little tiny people in big places? Those are all parts that add up to your consistent style. And once you've decided on all those things, and they should be things that you like. Who cares about trends? Trends are dumb. They come and go. You as an artist will outlast any trend. Yeah, hopefully if you stay in photography long enough. So figure out what you like. Don't worry about trends. Do what you like and maybe you start a trend. Who knows? It doesn't matter. Who cares about trends? Trends are dumb. Just say what you want to say with your photography and do it the way you want. And that is going to be good. So back to your original question. As long as you use Mass and Labs, I guess there's my pitch. As long as you use Mass and Labs, you are staying within a consistent style, even if you jump around from pack to pack. And the more consistent you want to get, hey, that's even better. If you want to pick like two or three presets and that's all you use for the next 10 years, sweet. That'll help make you more consistent. But yeah, you can go as deep as you want on that. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Hopefully that helps. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up everybody. If you have any more questions, you got like a couple minutes. And then I'll show you kind of the full, the full entire edited thing. So, alrighty, so here's this image and I'm just moving down the line. Okay, that's too bright, too cool. I'll warm it up a little bit again. Um, brighten that up a little bit, cool it down. Small adjustments. I, I hit previous a lot. You know, if, if the next photo is very similar to the one I just did, I'll just hit previous. I was trying to get a little bit red, so I'm going to add a tiny bit of green. And maybe cool it down. Previous. And it's too bright. Down. I might I might drop a uh, blah 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 uh, neutral density graduated filter the the tool with a, a million names just to knock down that bright uh, like kind of grassy thing at the top again e even in color your eye is going to go to either the brightest or warmest thing in the photo and I don't want to be looking at that stupid it's not stupid it's actually beautiful but the grass coming down I don't want to look at that so I'm just going to knock it down a little bit with one of these handy dandy filters. Um, I love this one. This one might this one might actually be a candidate for black and white. Why? I don't know, because my stomach, uh, like nerve brain cells in my stomach are saying to do it. Well, that's what I heard. I heard we actually have brain cells in our stomach or something like that. That's why you have like a gut feeling. So black and white, yes. The color was super distracting, right? It's really cool, but my eyes got going pom pom, pom pom, pom pom. Dress. Oh, wait. Here she is. There's her face. And with black and white, I'm just going like down this tunnel, like right to her eyes. Um, and in fact, I'm going to drop the. Uh, I use these all the time. So these neutral density filter thingies, that helps kind of knock it down. Um, I would actually use, I'm actually going to dip into a brush here real quick and uh, just darken some of this stuff. Okay, the, and you'll notice this is the most time I've taken with a photo this entire edit. Why? Because, I don't know, I just think it's worth it. Going to get rid of these things that are really bright because they're making my eye go there. Uh, we have auto mask turned on. I don't want that. Blip. Yeah, real quick and dirty. And then you just back it off a little bit. Cool. Now, doesn't that look good? That looks so good. 
that that's a cool photo. That's one of my favorites of the whole the whole set. Okay, you guys ready for the big? Oh wait, let's see a before and after. Before and after. I think it looks super cool in black and white. It's perfect. Okay, all right, everybody. Let's take a look at the whole set. I'll make these bigger. And here is what we just did. Um, if I wasn't blabbing on the whole time, this would have taken like, I would have probably edited these 39 images in about 10 minutes tops. But I wanna teach. So here we go. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. It's a nice little uh, lifestyle session. Um, nothing fancy, you know, just I mean, my, my approach to photography in general is just looking for natural moments and details and, you know, shooting with my gut. Um, if this was, if, if they were, if I was shooting this for an actual client, this was just kind of for fun. Uh, these are 39 images. I probably cut out some of these images, some of the similar ones, although it's already pretty tight. Like, I think they would enjoy all of these photos. Some good stuff. I come from the school of faces. I love faces, so I'm very, very much focused on faces. Everything that I need in life, uh, photography-wise, I find in the eyes. I, I really don't need anything else. I don't need anything fancy. I don't need big, epic locations or anything. I don't care. Um, when it comes down to it, for me, uh, life is just kind of the soul of of people like their soul uh, their energy and that to me comes through the eyes so these are all I mean these are all nice moments these are great moments of connection like that's that's a really nice moment right there the way they're looking at each other um, they're actually I thought they were touching hands here but it, they're not but that's a really nice moment and then uh, eyes you know eyes are really good um, and then if you look at my, you know, if you go to mastinstudio.com, you can see the remnants of my uh, wedding career, some of my favorite photos, and you can see that it is like mostly photos like this because that's all I need in life. That's it. That's all I like. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, that is a lifestyle shoot edit. Using the Fuji Everyday Pack, it is the Swiss army knife of tropical vacations and lifestyle and happiness. Um, it's a great pack. It's awesome. Uh, if you're watching this and you're not part of Mass and Labs, you should join us. I don't care if you own anything we make or not. Just go into the Mass and Labs group on Facebook. Join us. We will let you in. We will help you succeed as a photographer. We do videos like this once or twice a week, all year round. We've got hundreds of videos now. Um, it's a great place to learn. And you can also take one of your raw files and drop it in the group. And you'll have like 10 to 20 people edit it for you with any preset that we make. So you can see what it looks like on your image because that's a really good way to know if it fits your style before you buy. Um, if you're seeing this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. We've got videos, again, like I said, coming out all the time. And if you have any questions you want to ask us directly, just go to m.me forward slash Maston Labs. And this will put you right into our direct messages and we'll get back to you and help you out with whatever you need. So until next time, I hope you have a great day and happy editing.